I'm back here with another NVIDIA 1050 Ti powered laptop. This one's got four gigabytes of double data rate 5 RAM, just like the MSI GL62M that I reviewed. However, it doesn't have the same CPU. So this configuration, which is uh, the Lenovo Legion R720, has an i5 7300HQ. So that doesn't have hyper-threading unlike the 7000 700 HQ, that's an i7 branded one. That one's a little bit faster for 3D performance, but this CPU is perfectly fine for gaming as you'll find out later on in my gaming tests here. So it has eight gigabytes of RAM, the original configuration, but just using one uh, sodium slot out of the two. I've added another eight gigabytes of RAM here for my review, just so it's on the same playing field and level ground as my review with the MSI GL62M. So this one here, instead of just having a one terabyte drive like that model I reviewed, this also has an SSD, which was one of the benefits. It's got a fast PCIe four lane SSD in here. It's the Samsung PM961, and that's paired up with that slower spindle drive for your storage, so you can put files on that. You don't get a lot of free space on that fast drive, but boot times are excellent. It's under 10 seconds, and it gets into Windows desktop really, really blazing fast here which is good now the build of the laptop is all plastic and you can see it's got those red accents so you know straight away oh yeah it's a gaming laptop since they all tend to look the same so the lid of it has a little bit of flex but it's not bad it does show fingerprints but the build quality overall i do like now along the back here you will see that we do have some exit vents and the cooling on the system is excellent didn't run into any thermal throttling or any problems unlike the MSI that I reviewed, which did. That one ran into thermal throttling, got up to 89 degrees. This model here barely goes over 70, so straight away cooling is excellent on this, which it should be in a gaming laptop. Now opening up the lid here, the hinge is rather stiff, and this is the furthest it will go back, so not an amazing angle. I'll give you some more details on this matte-coated 1080p IPS panel in just a minute. Uh, you'll see up the top here, though, we do have a 720p webcam with dual array microphones. I'll give you a sample of that later on in the video. The bezel around the outside is rather thick as you can see. It's not super thin or modern looking, but at least it is matte, so we don't have any problems with reflections on the screen. Now it does have this rubber around the edges, which is a nice little touch that's gonna stop it from scratching up the palm rest, which is made out of plastic too, this palm rest. Now my biggest complaint with this laptop has to be the touchpad. It's an ELAN one, it does have ELAN's gesture controls and things like that, but it's rather poor, I don't like it. It's quite laggy, it's got your buttons there which to me feel a little bit, ah, oh, they just, you know, they're not amazing to use. And the main thing with the touchpad is it's a little bit inaccurate at the slower, minor, more little finer movements when you do do those, if you're doing like any editing work or using uh, Photoshop for example, um, it's just a real pain. And being a gaming laptop, I feel that most people would be using a mouse, so it's not a deal breaker, but if you happen to have no mouse and just using that touchpad, it will frustrate you. Now there is an, a solution on the internet, and that is to install, there's like a hack, to install over those ELAN drivers, Windows Precision drivers, to really improve that touchpad. Now I tried to do this on my unit without any success. Unfortunately, I just could not get them to install or run. Uh, the good news is, is the keyboard is quite nice. We get a numerical keyboard as well to, to the side of it there. And the travel is 1.3 millimeters. They have a really nice feel to them. This keyboard feels to type on almost identical to the Steel Series keyboards you often see on MSI's gaming laptops. It's backlit, so we've got two levels, either low brightness or the high brightness there you can see. And it's not a bad keyboard. It's definitely a typical Lenovo keyboard keyboard which is excellent so great to type on that is a huge positive there I do like it now you see above the keyboard we do have what looks like some grills here for an intake or ventilation this is in fact frontwards outwards spy firing speakers so these speakers they also have Dolby audio tweaks to them so it's really just basically an, an equalizer here so you can tweak the sound output so for ports now on the left hand side, we've got a Kensington lock there, which is good to have. So you can lock this down if you needed to, to a table at your work or whatever. And then we've got what looks like a USB port on here, type A port, but no, this is not. This is in fact the charging plug here. So it's very sturdy. In fact, I do like this move, even though 
They could have in fact made it maybe a USB port. It's a lot better than the typical barrel charger you see, the DCN, this is very strong, this port here. Uh, you get a status LED. We've got a gigabit uh, ethernet port there, a full sized USB, which is just USB 3. And then we have stereo headphones out with mic support and then a reset button there, which is good to see. We don't normally have this on most laptops. On the right hand side, so we've got two full size USB 3 ports again, an SD card reader. Now this SD card reader is uh, not that fast at all really, it maxes out about 24 megabytes per second, reads and writes. And then we have HDMI out. Now this is only uh, 30 hertz 4K maximum that it supports. It's not HDMI 2, which would have been nice to have on here. And then we do have a Type-C port. So this Type-C port does not support display out. It is only USB 3 data. So in the box you get an instruction leaflet, manual and whatnot. Now that's all in Chinese because this is an imported version here, which worked out to be a lot cheaper than buying locally. The power brick, now this is rated to 20 volts, 6.75 amps. So this is what is going to happen if you first power it on and it does not have English already installed from say the seller that you're buying this off. You're going to have to go through this Chinese process then. And as I mentioned at the start, it's probably best just to upgrade this to Windows 10 Pro and that keeps the drivers intact and the recovery partition intact. And you can get CD keys off eBay for literally only about five bucks or so. Taking a look at now at the software that you get with this. So you get Lenovo's Nerve Sense, which is probably the only thing you really want to keep on here because it does allow you to do this extreme cooling. So this allows you to basically put the fans on maximum. So it's very similar to MSI's Cooler Booster 4 that they use on the, um, the GR62M that I reviewed has something very similar. So you're turning that on and the fans will get rather loud then, but of course it will give you maximum cooling performance. Taking a look now at the performance of the screen. So it's a 15.6 inch 1080p IPS matte coated panel from LG. I'll quickly show you the hardware ID of this. And you'll see that this screen isn't actually really that good for professionals at all with the kind of results I got from the gamut tests I did on the color reproduction. So the monitor is an LG D0590. It's used in other gaming laptops and it's rather low end budget. So maximum brightness comes out at 280 lux, which is good. And on the lowest setting, it doesn't even register one lux. So it's very dark. So that's the positives of this screen here. But looking in closer detail at some of that calibration. So if we have a look here, you can see that the sRGB result of my testing here with my Spider 5 was 65%. So that is very poor for sRGB coverage. And then only 49% of Adobe RGB. So for professionals, if you wanted to use this for video editing, color editing and things like that, you need to have correct color uh, for photos and things like that. Not recommended at all. A budget gaming laptop is not where you would normally start anyway looking for an accurate 1080p screen. But for gaming, I find this screen is fine and general use. Moving on now to some synthetic benchmarks. This is Geekbench 4 there, the CPU scores. The OpenCL score here, so almost 100,000 there from the NVIDIA 1050 Ti. And I also ran 3D Marks Firestrike 1.1, so they got a score of 7,054. And Skydiver 1.0. 18,228 was the score there. So these are kind of on par with other 1050 Ti cards. Pass mark rating of 4,461. And then the wireless performance. So I've got a bit of a complaint here with the wireless that even connected up to my home network with a FTP server download over a very fast wireless AC router. I could not get any more than about 200 megabits per second. Same goes for the apartment here as well. We're just testing out the speeds here of my fiber line that I'm not able to get the full 300 megabits per second. The closest was this right here. So about a 170 download and about close to 200 upload only. So something's up with that. I tried different drivers, no luck. Could be their antenna configuration. It could be just my unit here. Also ran Cinebench R15, so the score here from the CPU, the 453 CB, is a lot lower than the hyper-threaded 
i7 7700HQ. Now that one could get about 720, so a big difference there. Now the thermals I wanted to cover this now, they are really, really good. After two hours of gaming continuously, the CPU hits 73 degrees only, so this is really good. So very good cooling on this. Lenovo have done their job with this particular gaming laptop and only 70 degrees on the GPU max, again, after two hours. So really excellent performance there. Very happy with that. Here's the Heaven benchmark here. So I did an overclock on this one and I managed to get a gain of 11.4% overclocking the GPU. And here is the stock score. So the stock score is 1704. So you gain about five frames per second or so more. Actually, it's more than that, around about eight frames per second average with the complete default setting there on the Heaven benchmark. So this CPU can multitask really well. I won't give you an example of that, but just to say that you can run a lot of things at the same time. So I even have Adobe Photoshop op open at the same time, just doing a video edit and streaming now 4K. So it can keep up with 4K. If you're going to be using other streaming services like Amazon Prime, this laptop is going to run it perfectly fine. As long as, of course, you have the fast enough internet connection that can maintain the kind of transfer rates you need for 4K streaming. So you can see here with the stats enabled, it's only dropped 13 frames here out of 3000 now, which is when I actually went from the smaller window to large full screens when it dropped a few frames there. But overall, very good performance when it comes to streaming 4K. It will play 4K HEVC codec files just fine, VP9 files too, perfectly fine with no issues. Now it's quite capable, the CPU, to edit 4K video. I'm running here Adobe Premiere Pro. It's the latest version, latest update, and the timeline that is all really quite fast. That's pretty much real time there, which is great. So I'll see how long it takes to encode and export a one minute clip here. So I'll be using the YouTube preset here for 4K. This is H.264 codec. And as soon as I hit export, I'm going to go over now and start that timer. I missed a few seconds on that. Now, on the other models that I've tested out, for example, the MSI gaming laptop, the GL62M, that did this export in around 3 minutes and 9 seconds or so. So it's interesting to see if without the hyper-threading and a similar clock speed, if it's going to be slower or not. Okay, so it's just about to finish up. I won't hit pause here until that meter disappears, but it's looking like, there we go, it's more or less about the same speed. In fact, probably a little bit faster, which surprises me, only by about 10 seconds or so. As I pointed out in the start of this review, we've got these front-facing speakers that, well, they sort of shoot outwards and upwards towards you, and that is accompanied with Dolby Audio software. It's basically just an equalizer. I'll give you a sample of them on 100% volume. Now the most interesting part of the review is gaming performance of course and I'm going to focus more on this because this is after all a gaming laptop. So we have an Nvidia 1050 Ti with 4 gigabytes of RAM on here. It's Samsung RAM. Now the maximum overclocks I managed to get on the memory is 800 more or less before it would end up crashing and causing a blue screen of death. Now on the MSI GL62M that I reviewed with the same exact GPU and RAM spec and even Samsung RAM, I managed to get 1,000. So this is going to vary from unit to unit. I've added 100 megahertz to the core clock. Now why I'm doing this is because it adds about 10% performance and there are no trade-offs. There's no instability with my current overclocks at the moment. There's no artifacts or anything. So that's why I'm doing it. So let's have a look at gaming performance now. Keep an eye on the thermals, the frame rate, which will be shown all of that information up on the left-hand corner. I'm going to start out here with Grand Theft Auto 5. So here we are with high settings and we're getting a decent frame rate here of around 85 frames per second. I have seen it as high as 100. But you know, there is quite a few cars here on screen. There's a bit to render, down to 70 now. But overall, really good considering that this is not medium settings high. The 1080 Ti there is doing a reasonably good job. There was just one stutter there that dipped down to 50. But overall, you can see this is fluid and really quite playable here. So no problems 
the 1050 Ti here handling a older game now, GTA 5. But still a very good title, this one. If you've never played it before, you're missing out. So um, let's move on now to the next game. Next up, I have Fortnite Battle Royale from Epic Games. I'm going to test it 1080p Epic setting, the preset, and we'll see how that one runs. So here we go. So it's rendering the view distance here is really quite good and still over 60 frames per second. Um, I've lost the people that were in my squad. I don't know where they've gone. So I'm going to head down towards some buildings. And okay, it's getting down to 50 frames per second. So I think high will be a lot better. And now running the high preset, you can see we're getting a much better frame rate. It's hovering around 70 to 80 frames per second. So this is much more desirable, much more fluid. And I recommend running this game on high. This title here now is probably the most demanding out of all the games I'm going to be testing. It is Kingdom Come Deliverance. And you can see that it's scraping about 40 frames per second. And this is on the medium preset here. So you wouldn't want to go any higher than this. And you might actually be better off playing this one on low. Now this game you could say is quite poorly optimized as well. So it's not the best. But it is very demanding. And even on my 1080 Ti I still can't really run maximum settings. And get over 60 frames per second all the time with this one. At least uh, on the resolution that I run. Which is much higher than 1080p here. So if I do start a quick little fight with just one of the guards here, anyone really, and you'll see that the frame rate is going to take even a bit more of a hit here. It's dropping down now to about 35. And you can see there was quite a few stutters just then with that arrow hitting the guard. But this, this happens really on any 1050 Ti. It's going to be about the same. So when there's lots going on right, right now, quite a bit of the NPCs around and a lot to render. Yeah, at least it's keeping over 30 frames per second. Honestly, I didn't expect it to be able to do 30 frames per second on medium. This isn't bad. You just need to tweak the settings and and perhaps even run low, as I suggested for this title here. So this next title here is Project Cars on high settings. And it's getting over 60 frames per second, so that's not too bad. We're just below at the moment. Green, green, green. When you think close to 60 is good, this is definitely very playable on high. And a racing game doesn't matter as much as, say, a first person shooter. That frame right there. And it does look, as you can see, visually really good. The next title I'm checking out is The Witcher 3. Now this is a demanding game, it's on 1080p and I've set it to the high settings. And you'll see that it's actually doing alright with this current setting here. It's hovering around 60 frames per second, which is not bad at all considering the hardware. So I think you can get away with running it on high. And if you are worried about that frame rate, like for example right then it dipped down to 49 frames per second. Then of course lower that down to medium. But great to see the game running 1080p with these kind of frame rates. So thermals are the area where this laptop is really good and really excels here to show you that the palm rest and above the keyboard here, it does stay relatively cool. Only 33 degrees, 36 is really the maximum you're going to see. The palm rest is only about 24 degrees, so it remains cool to the touch around the touchpad as well, about 23 degrees. 
Now I'll give you a sample of the fan noise. This is gaming 100% and it's going to be like this continuous and this will give you an idea of what to expect. But for a gaming laptop it's actually quite good and not too bad the kind of fan noise we have. Now if you wanted to run a Linux on this, I've got some good news here that it runs Linux perfectly fine. The touchpad is working, the screen brightness control, the audio controls, Bluetooth, wireless, everything so far in my testing seems to work with the latest Linux Manjaro build. Now taking a look at the front facing webcam. So it does tend to shake around a little bit. This table isn't 100% sturdy and if you start typing you can hear a bit of the noise from the keyboard. We've got dual array microphones there and the resolution it shoots at is 720p, 30 frames per second. And overall, I feel for this kind of budget gaming laptop that the quality of the webcam is all right. It's not amazing. If you want better quality, then use, of course, an external full HD Logitech webcam or something similar. Okay guys, so to quickly recap here, the build quality is really quite decent. Yes, it's all made out of plastic and we do have the red accent. Backlit keyboards, great to type on. Touchpad, I do not like it for the reasons I went over because it's ELAN, it doesn't support Windows Precision drivers. Well, you might be able to get it to work. Apparently you can hack those drivers and install them, but I couldn't get it to work for me. Other than that, running on the default setup with that touchpad, it's frustrating to use, it's laggy. No, I don't like it, I use a mouse. Most people will be gaming with the mouse anyway. Now, gaming performance from the 1050 Ti, it's quite good, you can overclock it and squeeze out an extra 10% or so, which is good, a little bit of a boost there. And all the games I tested, so all your AAA titles, they're all gonna be perfectly fine and playable 1080p on this. You just have to set high or medium settings, some of the more advanced and more demanding settings, just to tone them down a little bit on this particular GPU. So the i5-7300HQ, I feel is a perfect match for this GPU. It does not CPU limit it at all, and not, not run, it does not run into a CPU uh, thermal throttling at all. But if you intend to do 3D CAD and video editing and stuff like that, and you need more performance, go for the, uh, the i7-7000HQ, because that one has hyper-threading, this does not. So you only got the quad core on there, and the other CPUs, they act like really like an octa-core because of the hyper-threading on each of those cores. Battery life is another area which is really bad on this, but that's to be expected. Gaming laptops never have good battery life. So you've got powerful hardware and only a 41 watt battery in here. So it burns through it in about two hours if you're not gaming. And if you're gaming, you're only going to get really around an hour. So if you forget the power supply, then game over with this laptop if you intended to game on it. So wireless is one area where I've got a bit of an issue with my unit that I should be able to get out of the Intel 3165 about 400 megabits per second performance throughput and I'm only getting around 200 maximum on downloads and uploads. So something is up with the antenna configuration on this or the drivers. Now I did update the drivers, I tried some newer drivers and some older drivers from Intel and I still had no luck with that. So Bear in mind that that's not great. And also what isn't great for professionals that want to do photo editing, uh, you need really accurate, good color on the screen. You're going to be disappointed with this one because it's only got a gamut of 50% uh, Adobe RGB coverage. So that is really, really poor for professional use. I wouldn't be using it for the average Joe, for gaming and looking at your photos and internet, it's perfectly fine for that. So don't worry about that there. But overall, for the 899 US, I paid for this particular model here. I think it's a good deal. You've got some really nice performance. As a gaming laptop, it works. I recommend it over the MSI GL62M. By the way, please check out my review of that one up there if you are interested in another NVIDIA 1050 Ti gaming laptop with four gigabytes of RAM. Thank you so much for watching this review here, and I do hope to see you back in the channel. If you're new, please think about subscribing, and also, while you're at it, why not give this video a like? See you later.